Good afternoon, everybody. I have with me today the administrator of FEMA, Deanne Criswell. We also have the dual status commander of uh, Title 10, Brigadier General Charles Morrison. Commander of U.S. Northcom, General Greg Gio. We also have our Secretary of the Department of Public Safety, Eddie Buffalo, our Secretary of the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, uh, Greer Martin. We also have uh, our Secretary of the Department of Public Safety, Eddie Buffalo, I've already recognized you. Our Colonel, Commander of the North Carolina National Guard is, is with us today, Freddie Johnson. And we also have our Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense, Rebecca, Rebecca Zimmerman here. There is progress in Western North Carolina toward recovery. We are grateful for the thousands of local, state, and federal officials who are working in a coordinated way to bring relief to the people who from an unprecedented, devastating storm. We know that there is much more to do, but we know that the people here are determined and resilient. We're also grateful for communities that have pulled together like never before. We're grateful for the volunteers, communities of faith, who have coordinated their efforts with government officials to make sure that we are reaching the people who need to be reached. Please know that anyone, anyone who needs help we are determined to provide it to them. Right now, we have 1,700 active duty National Guard activated. And one of the purposes of this event today is to talk about the integration of our U.S. Armed Forces with our National Guard, with our FEMA forces who are here on the ground, with our state emergency management and state and local law enforcement officers. We're grateful for the work that has gone on. We know that there is much more to do. We're still opening roads. We're still working to reach communities. We still have search and rescue occurring as we speak. But we know, we know the people of North Carolina and will pull together and that the people of Western North Carolina will recover from this storm and will work to be more resilient than ever. I'm now going to recognize the administrator of FEMA, Deanne Criswell. Administrator. Thank you, Governor, <clears throat> and good morning, everybody. I've been here in North Carolina for a week now, a week today. I've visited a dozen of the communities with the governor. I have been side by side with Governor Cooper, talking to mayors, talking to local officials, talking to the local sheriffs, talking to the fire chiefs and hearing from them, listening to what their needs are to support their community and to make sure that we are bringing in the resources that are needed. And I want to assure you, as I have told the governor, that we at FEMA and the entire federal family are here to support the needs of these communities and delivering exactly what they want, where they want, and when they need it. I listened to these local officials during these visits to identify what else needed to come in. To one of the things we identified was the ability to get commodities from the points of distribution to the front doors because we knew that there were a number of isolated and uh, limited access communities that were out there. I am so appreciative that my DOD colleagues are here with us today to support us in this critical mission. The Title X forces augmenting the incredible work that the National Guard has been doing since day one, helping us to truly meet people where they are and bring them these basic needs to help during this response. An event of this size requires significant support, and it requires that support from the entire federal family. I have been coordinating with my counterparts from all of the different departments and agencies to make sure we're bringing in what we need to support this community. 
I have engaged with their senior leadership, and to date, we have brought in nearly 3,400 federal responders from across the different departments and agencies to North Carolina. This is 20 different departments and responders. This is on top of the 1,500 personnel from the Department of Defense that you'll hear from, as well as the thousands that you've heard from Governor Cooper, from the National Guard, and all of the first responders that have been out in these communities since day one. This is a big team, but this is what is required. I have seen and I have led complex events. This is a complicated event, but let me be clear, FEMA is good at complexity. Our team, we are coordinators, we are collaborators, we are problem solvers, but we are also part of a larger team. And so I am grateful to be surrounded here today by my partners from the Department of Defense who are so committed to helping to support this mission and together we will be here with North Carolinians as long as it takes. And with that, I'll turn it over to General Morrison. Thank you, ma'am. Today, uh, it's my honor to be the dual status commander and my role is to ensure unity of effort between our National Guard forces, which the administrator said have been here since before the storm, and now our active duty military forces that have come in to our assistance and to achieve unity of effort. Today, the citizens of North Carolina have a joint task force that's made up of over 3,300 both active duty and National Guard military forces. That includes 918 vehicles and over 41 aircraft. Your North Carolina National Guard continues the efforts that they have had since well before the storm in places here like Asheville and all across Western North Carolina. That also includes National Guard from across the 54 states of the Union. Just yesterday, we received two more engineer task forces from both Michigan and Virginia to add to that critical need here to our relief efforts. I want to speak to a moment about the active Army integration that has been seamless. Early communication between senior leaders allowed us to make sure that these active duty forces were equipped properly for the mission at hand. Normally, active duty forces are deploying to fight and win our nation's wars, and so we organized for the mission. Task Force Castle, which came right out of Fort Liberty here in North Carolina, arrived in Marion, North Carolina, and with probably three or four hours of sleep, was conducting missions. They are on their third day of missions here in North Carolina doing route clearance, and at the same time delivering those commodities that the administrator talked about to places that may not have had access to them before. But what they are finding is progress. They are finding that most places have most of the humanitarian assistance that they need, and in some cases they just needed assistance with donation management. So you have soldiers, both National Guard and active duty alike, helping organize the massive amount of donations from generous people from all across this nation. And at the same time, providing relief as we continue to push humanitarian assistance relief. The 101st soldiers from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, arrived with infantry squad vehicles. I will liken these to all-terrain vehicles, and they are immediately assisting our FEMA partners with wide area searches to continue to make sure that we have located all individuals and also where we might need to deliver more supplies. We also are having them team up with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Commissioner Troxler has provided us with locals who know the people and the terrain to allow us to get into areas that we might not have access so far to this point. Our partnership with the Department of Defense and this status is exactly why the dual status was uh, invented after the, uh, after the response to Katrina so many years ago. It allows us to seamlessly integrate all components of the military, both National Guard and active, to achieve that unity of effort in our response to relieve the, Western, relieve the suffering of our fellow citizens here in Western North Carolina. And I'll be followed by the Commander of the United States Northern Command. Sir? I'm uh, General Greg Eel. I'd like to thank uh, Governor Cooper, Administrator Chriswell, and uh, Brigadier General Morrison. 
like to acknowledge the tremendous amount of tireless work and effort by thousands of people and hundreds of organizations that are bringing aid to the citizens of North Carolina. As the commander of U.S. NORTHCOM, we're honored to support the state, FEMA, and the dual status commander, Brigadier General Morrison, by providing active duty forces in a number of areas that can fall under his command and control using the dual status commander role that is comes from the president through the secretary of defense at the request of governor cooper which allows him uniquely to command and control both state and federal forces at the same time that will bring the citizens of north carolina unity of effort and response where we can provide the types of capabilities that are needed that will fall side by side with the north carolina national guard troops under his able and forward-thinking leadership. As General Morrison mentioned, uh, the first wave of response has been helicopters from uh, Fort Liberty, uh, engineering uh, battalion from Fort Liberty, and then also the uh, infantry battalions that are coming in from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. But I should point out that those uh, and the 101st Airborne, but they are part of the 18th Airborne Corps, the elite unit based out of uh, Fort Liberty that is providing the majority of the 1,500 person Title 10 response. Additionally, uh, we have some Navy helicopters that are working directly for uh, Administrator Criswell and FEMA, and then we have some uh, very capable search and rescue aircraft that are across the border in Tennessee at uh, McGee Tyson Air National Guard Base that are flying 10 hour sorties a day uh, throughout Western North Carolina, uh, providing search and rescue and landing to provide basic uh, uh, medical care and wellness checks uh, throughout the region. I'd like to close by saying it is a tremendous honor for us to support uh, not only Brigadier General Morrison as the commander of these forces, but the state and FEMA in this most important and honorable mission for us, which is to help fellow citizens. Again, thank you very much. Okay, we'll be glad to take your questions. You mentioned progress is being made, um, but we don't have a timeline of when water can be restored for the people here, making it difficult for people to plan how to move forward. What's your expectation for having water restored in Western North Carolina? Well, that's going to be a community by community event because we had more than 50 water systems throughout Western North Carolina that were. Uh, impaired or destroyed. Many of them are coming back when the power comes back. So people are getting water uh, a bit at a time. We're, by the, that I mean that communities are coming on one at a time. We're seeing progress in that. As for Asheville uh, and the places in Buncombe County it serves, it's still going to be a while. There is progress being made but we don't know yet. We have uh, engineers from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers who are here working with uh, civil engineers and others to make sure that, that we are doing everything we can to get water back on all over Western North Carolina, but we don't have a specific timeline on, on Asheville Buncombe right now. Do you have anything on that? saying that are misinformed or intentionally uh, providing misinformation. Uh, we have thousands of local, state, and federal officials who are working in North Carolina and who are making sure that people have what they need. There are some very isolated communities that they're doing airdrops and working to find temporary ways to get to them, but if knew what was happening on the ground, you would see that there is a coordinated effort to help people. Already, uh, FEMA has, I think, more than um, 104,000 people who have registered for assistance for the $31 million has been distributed. They have 1,700 people in hotel rooms in their temporary uh, uh, shelter program. 
there's a lot that's happening right now to help people where they're at. We still don't want tourists coming to Western North Carolina right now. We need to preserve roads for the commodities that are coming in, for utility workers, for cell phone workers, for people who are medical assistance. There's a lot of work going on to provide, uh, making sure that people are getting their oxygen, making sure they're getting their regular medical supplies. So we don't want people coming right now. Uh, there will be some roads that will take quite a while in, in order to repair because if you've been to Western North Carolina, you know that some roads are very rugged on a beautiful day with, with no storm. Uh, roads that have been damaged are going to take a while to repair, but we've already gotten $100 million in beginning emergency response from federal DOT. Our state legislature is going in uh, Wednesday to provide additional funding. So we've got everybody on the ground working to repair these roads. Absolutely false. We are managing this disaster across six states right now. Uh, we continue to bring in resources. I had people on the ground before this disaster, before the storm hit this part of Western North Carolina. We have continued to bring in those resources. And it was part of me being here on Monday of last week, working with the governor to identify what additional resources need to be coming in. And if you've been out here and you've seen the air traffic coming in here and moving out into the communities, they are moving supplies, FEMA supplies, but also donated supplies. We have thousands of people on the ground, not just federal, but also our volunteers in the private sector. And frankly, that type of rhetoric is demoralizing to our staff that have left their families to come here and help the people of North Carolina. And we will be here as long as they're here. Has what had an effect on operations? Oh, the rumor, I mean, what it does is it really affects the morale of our people who are trying so hard to get into communities. But the biggest effect, I would say, is people that have been impacted are afraid to apply for our assistance. Assistance that then they can get a hotel room. They can get reimbursement for some of the costs or damages to their home. If I can't get them to apply, I can't give them the money and the resources that they're eligible for. And we're hearing that people are afraid to apply for the assistance. And so we need them to know. I've heard rumors that if you take our $750 and don't pay it back, we're going to take your home. Absolutely false. The $750 gets you money to help with your medicine or the food you lost in your refrigerator. And then we're going to give additional money for the repairs to your homes and the items that were lost. We're going to help with any rental that they incur or any of the displacement costs if they went and stayed at a hotel. All of that reimbursed. And I can't give it to them if they don't apply. If people are afraid to apply, then it is hurting them.
the rest of the funding will continue to come, but again, I need people to apply for that so we can get them the resources they need. Have you answered that, North Carolina? Yeah, so I have a question. Are there people still unaccounted for at this point, and if so, how many, and what areas? So that number is rapidly dwindling as federal and state officials are working to check on reports that have been given to the central place regarding people who may be missing or people they haven't been able to get in contact with. We know a lot of reunifications have occurred that have not been reported back. We know that a lot of people have finally gotten cell phone service and talked to the people who made the report that hasn't gotten back to us. We should have a good number on that maybe by the end of the day or tomorrow. The administrator and I were just talking about that, and we'll try to get that number out publicly because I know a lot of people are interested in it, and they should be because we are checking on every report that we get. There are soldiers and National Guard and emergency management people going door to door working to try to find people when there is a report that they have not gotten a communication, but that number has dwindled significantly, and we hope to give you that number very soon. Okay, thank you. Is this for Governor Cooper or any DOT staff? Does any updates that you can provide on accessing the roads leading to reservoirs near Black Mountain or Swannanoa and what particular challenges you're facing in terms of clearing those roads and providing access to those reservoirs? I don't have specific information with me on that, and I don't think I have a transportation secretary with me. We will get you that information, Jordan, if you can make sure that we find that out. We've got a little over 100 roads that we're working to clear, and those kinds of roads were prioritized to make sure that we're getting utility crews in, repair crews in, making sure that we can get commodities to people who haven't been reached. Thank you all. That's the time we have.